my topic is lung ultrasound in 20 minutes for any ultrasound topic to me always seems uh, too short, but we'll dive in. Um, I had the opportunity to study with uh, Dr. Lichtenstein, um, who's pictured there over in, in France. And uh, he's what many would consider the father of lung ultrasound and possibly the father of point of care ultrasound. So it was truly a privilege. So we're going to dive in here. So why lung ultrasound? Well, acute dyspnea is one of our most common presenting complaints um, and multiple diagnoses present similarly. And so our history and physical may not be able to distinguish uh, between those etiologies. And our most common imaging modality, the portable chest X-ray, is pretty limited in evaluating the cause of acute dyspnea. Also, if you're doing procedures such as thoracentesis, they're much safer when performed with ultrasound. So lung ultrasound is also more sensitive and specific for nearly every diagnosis when compared with chest X-ray. And this is from actually uh, from evidence, not from just people's experience. So for those that are not acquainted with lung ultrasound, you want to get acquainted with it because it can really be a game changer when working up acute dyspnea and other complaints. The problem is, is lung ultrasound is different. So most of the other modalities that we do in point of care ultrasound, you're seeing the anatomy um, where with lung ultrasound, we're actually predominantly looking at artifacts. And so at first it can be intimidating, but once you learn the language um, and the, uh, the signs and the artifacts of lung ultrasound, it's actually um, not a difficult modality as far as the basic application. So today um, we're going to start with just reviewing the 10 basic signs of lung ultrasound. Um, then we're going to look at the profiles of lung ultrasound in the blue protocol. And then we're going to try to correlate those lung ultrasound profiles with specific pathologic syndromes and diseases. And then we'll review with some cases if there's time. So I'm going to skip most of the background of lung ultrasound and the how to's. Um, your people teaching you at the stations today should be able to cover a lot of this, but I'm going to mention a few things. One is lung zones. So um, there is proposed consensus on uh, numbering lung zones, but in practice, there is actually not consensus. But historically, zone one was the anterior lung. Um, the zone two was lateral and zone three was posterior. And then we just broke those into the superior and inferior kind of halves. And so you had this uh, six um, area system on each side, 12 in total. Um, there's an international consensus document that just does the anterior and the lateral zones um, proposed by Volpicelli. And, uh, but then there's also others um, that propose like Lichtenstein specific points. And then in this COVID area, uh, we're not sure if that eight uh, zone protocol is adequate, but nonetheless, just realize that there are um, actual zones in um, numbers and consensus on this. Um, some propose just describing it anatomically, then there's no confusion. So if I said the superior anterior right lung, everyone knows where I'm at rather than which number it is. The other quick mention is that uh, the transducer that you're going to use uh, may differ. Uh, but one of the most common mistakes I see is people only using the high frequency linear for lung ultrasound. In fact, if you're going to pick one probe, I'd say pick the curvilinear, um, the low frequency probe here. And the reason being is that the high frequency linear is great for evaluating the plural line as we found it has good resolution, but it doesn't have sig significant or sufficient penetration to review the rest of the lung. Um, and then some lung, lung experts um, would recommend the microconvex probe because of its balance between low and high in a small footprint, but you probably don't have access to that. Um, most places they combine the curvilinear and the linear um, to get the information that they need. All right, so with that being said, then uh, we are going to jump right into the 10 basic signs of lung ultrasound. Now, um, here is Lichtenstein's figure of that, and I'm not going to do them in that order, but the first is the bat sign. And the bat sign um, is named that because it's supposedly uh, you can see this as kind of a bat flying to you. 
Uh, and again, I don't know if I visualize it that way, but I do appreciate the importance of the bat sign. And the importance is to find the plural line. That's going to be your key landmark. So because we're imaging from the outside in, in lung ultrasound, I'd rather you just know the, the layers of the anatomy, right? So here's gonna be skin, then you're gonna have subcutaneous um, fat tissue here, then you're gonna have muscle, so usually pectoralis anteriorly and some other muscles laterally. And then after that, you're gonna see a, a rib and a rib with shadowing. Shadowing because of what you learned in the first lecture, it's, um, bony cortex reflects all the sound back and so you don't see beyond it. And then you'll have the intercostal segment here. And then and only then can you say that this here is the plural line. And of note that this is deep to the ribs. That's the most important thing to identify. So that's a, a linear picture on the left and here is a curvilinear picture which depicts the same anatomy. But very quickly then we can see rib and rib. So this right here is the plural line. So the bat sign number one is to know the anatomy and to identify the plural line. And along the plural line, we should see lung sliding. And lung sliding is because during respiration, the visceral and parietal pleura move in opposition to each other and create this um, lung sliding artifact. There's some short comet tail artifacts that are seen here that are normal. Um, and there's that ant marching along the line that uh, um, James mentioned. Uh, and then another thing that you should identify is that if you look at the compartment above um, the pleura, and if you look at the compartment below the pleural line, notice that this is static, right? It, there's some movement of the chest wall, um, but there is not significant um, movement. Where here, you see this sparkling um, movement, and that's uh, due to that, that artifact of lung sliding. So that's another way to show that there's lung sliding is divide those in compartment. So lung sliding is normal. Uh, in normal lung. And if we do this in M mode, so with M mode, you're going to stick that M mode cursor uh, down the um, intercostal space, and then you're going to follow that out over time, motion over time, M mode. And then you'll see this compartment above the pleural line has relatively static in its movement. That's why there's straight lines. You do see in the muscular and intercostal segments here, that there's some movement of respiration, that's normal. But now contrast that to below the pleural line, you have this grainy appearance that corresponds with that sparkling appearance. And this is said to be that seashore sign, like waves coming into the seashore, you hit the pleural line and then it's all sandy. So that's just the M mode equivalent of lung sliding and that's normal lung. Now we contrast that to lack of lung sliding. Here we see along the pleural line, above it, it's static. Below it, it's static. There's no ants marching along the line. There's no short comet tail artifact. And if we march that o out in M mode, again, we're taking a slice of the B mode image. We're projecting it over time. And we're going to see the same static appearance. Again, you don't see the sandy beach, you see what would be called the stratosphere sign in Lichtenstein's terminology. Some call it the barcode sign. And again, the stratosphere sign depicted here. And one thing I see tripping a lot of people up is that they, de they do see movement here, here, here. The key point is that if the movement is mirrored above and below, identically, the plural line on M mode, that is artifact arising from movement of respiration. If there's a contrast in the above and below compartments, so there, for example, would be movement right here where I look above and there's no movement, that is actually lung sliding. Um, it may be subtle, but it's there. And so M mode can really help with that subtle lung sliding. And then continuing on looking at the line, there's a very specific sign that we see here. So what if we were to see lung sliding on one side of the intercostal space and lack of lung sliding on the other intercostal space. Well, that there is the transition zone um, between normal lung and air in the pleural space, otherwise known as the pneumothorax. And we see another example here. 
where on this side we see sliding, this side we do not, and then that transition point right here is called the lung point. There's nothing else that produces this in ultrasound other than a pneumothorax, although you do have to be careful when you're scanning close to the diaphragm and the pericardium um, as where the lung stops, it can look like a lung point. But if you're scanning away from those areas, then uh, this is pathognomonic for pneumothorax. So <clears throat> our 10th uh, sign in lung ultrasound is that lung point. And here's what it would look like in M mode where you have the sandy beach on one side and the, uh, and the stratosphere sign on the other. Moving on to A lines. A lines are reverberation fact from uh, um, the pleura. So you'll notice that they are equidistant from the skin to the pleural line, and they're a horizontal reverberation artifact. I want you to remember that A lines equal air. Anytime there is air, you will have A lines. Air in normal lung, also air in a pneumothorax. The difference between pneumothorax and normal lung will then, you'll have that lack of lung sliding and lung point in a pneumothorax. That's contrasted with B lines. B lines, one is shown here. They arise from the pleural line. They're this vertical hyperechoic kind of flashlight beam type artifact um, that uh, arises when there is an interstitial process. So interstitial thickening in the form of fluid, in the form of pus or inflammation, in the form of um, fibrosis or scar tissue. So I want you to think of B lines when they're pathologic as interstitial syndrome, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. Now one B line or two B lines are not pathologic. So Lichtenstein calls three or more B lines as lung rockets. So again, one or two B lines is not pathologic, three or more are. And these can be further divided into septal and ground glass rockets. We're not going to cover the details of that here, but just recognize this pattern, these vertical flashlight beam um, tail artifacts that arise from the pleural line, they obliterate the A line, they're white, they go off the screen, and you see again three or more per interspace. And they can become confluent as well, where it almost looks like there's two or three B lines that become confluent, or in, um, as it progresses, whiting out the entire screen. And again, this is just to depict that there is a spectrum in these B lines. All right. Going to the other 10 signs, we have the shred sign and the tissue sign, the tissue-like sign. So the tissue-like sign is just, it looks like there is tissue in the lung. So um, here we see what looks like tissue appearance with these white air bronchograms inside um, as compared with tissue of abdominal organs. And then below that tissue-like sign, there's a shredded lung line the shredded appearance, and that's just where the sound beam meets the consolidated lung and air interface, produces the shredded lung line. And both the shred sign and the tissue-like sign are signs of consolidation. Here's a translobar consolidation. Again, some call this hepatization of the lung as it looks like there's liver tissue in the lung, the difference being the normal uh, black Hepatic vasculature is now white. That white is air in air bronchograms. So consolidation can be more subtle. Some would call this subplural. Um, Lichtenstein would say that all consolidation is subplural um, by definition, but it's more just is the size of it. But again, you see these small tissue-like areas with shredded sign below them. Uh, this, these are both signs of pleural effusion. We have the quad sign and the sinusoid sign. So when you put fluid in between the visceral and parietal pleura, by definition is a pleural effusion. And so the rib shadows create the sides and the visceral and parietal pleura uh, create the, this quadrangle shape with fluid in between, that's called the quad sign. And then if you were to put M mode through this area, and watch it over time with res respiration, you'd see here the visceral pleura up and down creating the sinusoid sign. Those are both signs of pleural effusion. And pleural effusions can have a varied appearance um, from size and complexity, and they're not all anechoic. So it's important to recognize um, that fluid 
or pathology in that pleural space. And here's an example of a very trace to small to moderate to large um, pleural effusion. And this is the more traditional um, location of imaging a pleural effusion in the most dependent area of the lung. But again, they can look different. Here's an example of a loculated pleural effusion. And here's an example of a frank empyema. Notice that these do have echoes and so, so don't say that a pleural effusion just has to be anechoic. It's complicated if it has echoes in it, complicated effusion. All right, so those are the signs. We're gonna move on to the profiles here. That's taking the signs, so the individual things I see at each lung area that I'm scanning and now putting it into a profile. So I'm just gonna remark on a paper that you should read, The Blue Protocol, which established a lot of this. And there's a, a book that expands on those topics. And basically, in the protocol, they took all these signs that we talked about, A lines, B lines, consolidation, et cetera. And then they correlated them with disease entities and then made profiles out of those. Profiles are basically one uh, kind of a one sentence or one word way of describing all of your lung findings in one rather than have, having to say, well, in this zone, I saw that. And in that zone, I saw this. And then in this zone. So uh, a kind of the one sentence way of describing everything. So to talk about the proto, proto, um, profiles, I just have to um, bring up a concept called PLAPS because you'll see in the blue protocol what this PLAPS term. And it just stands for poster lateral alveolar and or pleural syndrome. What does that mean? It just means that you have signs of consolidation, that's alveolar syndrome, or pleural effusion, that's pleural syndrome, one or the other or both in the dependent area of the lung. That's all it is simply. So then let's look at these profiles. And here's a slide showing the sensitivities, specificities, positive and negative predictive values of the disease entities in their ultrasound profiles. And if you briefly glance through these, they're very good, um, most in the uh, 80 and 90s. And the um, blue pro protocol um, makes you correct about 90.5% of the time, um, according to Lichtenstein's protocol. So. so profile one we're gonna talk about is the B profile. That's just a diffuse interstitial syndrome meaning you see three or more B lines diffusely throughout the lung. Nine times out of 10, that's going to be cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but there are some other entities that can produce this, such as ARDS, interstitial pneumonia, interstitial lung disease, bronchiolitis. But there are some nuances into differentiating this from this, which we won't have time to cover in this 20 minute lecture. But again, B profile, think diffuse interstitial syndrome, majority of the times, CHF um, or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Next is the A profile, no DVT, no PLAPS. Now in Lichtenstein's protocol, he did do um, venous analysis. Again, we're not covering that in the lung ultrasound lecture. But if you think about this, this just means A profile, normal lung, no DVT, no DVT, no PLAPS, so no um, consolidation or pleural effusion. Well, this, you want to think, is obstructive lung disease, COPD or asthma, and obviously your clinical picture should, could, uh, should fit this. And then consider that you could have the possibility that this is PE without DVT, um, but that happens a small percentage of the time in this protocol. The next is the A profile plus a DVT. So again, clear lungs, positive DVT, and the patient's in respiratory failure, well, they have a PE. The next is the A prime profile. Anytime you see prime in Lichtenstein's profiles, it just means there's lack of lung sliding. So this is A lines, lack of lung sliding plus a lung point, that's 100% positive predictive value for pneumothorax. If you had an A profile without a lung point, well, you could have a pneumothorax as could be seen in a 100% pneumothorax because there will be no lung point, um, but it may be something else and you may need other imaging. The B profile, sorry, the B prime profile, which would be B lines without lung sliding, think of as the, the pleural getting stuck together by an infectious process, 
So that's typically pneumonia, can be seen in bronchiolitis. The AB profile, A lines on one side, B lines in another area, that's typically pneumonia. Think of this as a focal interstitial syndrome. The C profile is signs of consolidation. So that shred sign and that tissue-like sign. This is typically pneumonia, but consider other causes of consolidation or even masses, but typically pneumonia. And then an A profile, normal lung, no v DVT, but you see plaps, consolidation or pleural effusion. Posteriorly, this is usually bacterial pneumonia. And I put this very small, but there was one case in, in the study of PE without DVT that produced plaps. So if we put all this together, and I know my time is going over, so I'm going to end here. If we put all this together, um, then I ask myself three clinical questions every time that I do a study. And the clinical questions are, number one, is there lung sliding, yes or no, at this area? Number two, what's the artifact predominance, A lines or B lines? Do I have predominantly air or is there an interstitial syndrome present? And then lastly, is there signs of consolidation or pleural effusion? And then if you put that together, you can see, you can go down this algorithm. If lung sliding is present and you have a B profile, pulmonary edema. If lung sliding is abolished and you have B lines, it's pneumonia. It's abolished in A lines plus a lung point pneumothorax, all the things that we covered. So I ask myself those three questions at every site that I scan in the lungs, and then I put it together with clinical correlation to find out what disease um, is causing the patient's ultrasound findings and clinical findings. So with that, I'm going to um, finish.